Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, committed to teaching, research, and professional training with degree programs in multiple locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Embassy Suites by Hilton Charleston, an all-suite hotel and conference center minutes from Yeager Airport and Capital Market. Reservations and brasserie dining information available at hilton.com. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Good evening from Charleston. I'm Bob Brunner. Welcome back to West Virginia Public Broadcasting Series, The Legislature Today. You can tune in every Monday through Friday to get a daily rundown on the news from the Capitol building. On the opening day of the session, the Senate got down to business and suspended its rules to pass 23 bills immediately onto the House of Delegates. Most of these bills the upper chamber passed last year, but for one reason or another did not become law. The House of Delegates introduced nearly 500 bills on opening day, but all were sent to the appropriate committees for consideration. Many will never see the light of day again. Senior Senator from the 17th for question am has consented that the bill be taken up for immediate consideration. Committee reference be dispensed with and the bill be read a first time. Is there objection? Chair, here's none. Senior Senator from the 17th. Mr. President, I move the constitutional rule requiring the bill to be read on Three different days be suspended. The bill be read a second and third time and placed upon its passage. Both chambers gaveled in today for short sessions and introduced several more bills, most sent to committee, but the Senate did suspend its rules again that the bills must be read on three successive days and several bills were passed through. The legislature looks a bit different this year. The numbers are still the same, but the 2022 election and redistricting have changed things a bit. I have West Virginia's governmental reporter Randy Yoey uh, from WVPB Broadcasting. He's uh, in the station here to discuss what has changed in the legislature. So Randy, what's all this redistricting meant? Well, Bob, first of all, it's good to be working with you again. Uh, redistricting by law must be completed every 10 years to account for changes in population. Now, West Virginia lost some population in the last 10 years. So what really changed were the Senate boundary lines. They transversed county boundary lines, but by code, the number of senators, 34, has to remain the same. So we used to have large delegate districts from big counties and small delegate districts sometimes covering a couple of counties. Now it's all one member districts. How does that work? Single member districts. While well, legislation passed in 2018 required West Virginia to create single member districts. So during the 2021 redistricting process, the state created 100 single member districts, doing away with that previous mix you're talking about of 67. After the November election, there seemed to be a lot of uh, changing around to uh, what's going on here and there, but uh, uh, how does that affect the way the legislature uh, works through its uh, process now? Well, let's start with the House of Delegates. Yeah. Um, so following that November election, the numbers for the legislative Republican supermajority became what I'm hearing some say are a super, super majority. Or super duper, I've heard. <laughs> I heard that too. <laughs> 88 Republicans, 12 Democrats in the House of, of, of Delegates. Now, Delegate Roger Hanshaw, Republican from Clay County, will continue as Speaker of the House. Delegate Matthew Rohrbach uh, from Cabell County, he leaves the Health Committee chairmanship to assume a new role as deputy speaker, so Hanshaw will be leaning on him throughout the session. Delegate Amy Summers, Republican out of Taylor County, who's also a nurse, will take over as health committee chair. And Delegate Eric Householder, Republican from up in Berkeley County, he'll be the new House Majority Leader. He's a banker and comes from the Finance Committee, so they'll be leaning a lot on him for his banking acumen. Delegate Doug Scaff, a Democrat from Kanawha County, will remain the House Minority Leader. And what about the Senate? Well, the Senate, it, here we go, a super duper majority again, and this time in spades. There are now 31 Republicans and just three Democrats wow. in the entire Senate. 
It was 30 and 4 until Senator Glenn Jeffries, a former Democrat from Putnam County, he was the person who helped make this Berkshire Hathaway development project in Ravenswood a reality. He wrote that letter to Warren Buffett and he responded, well, he switched to the Republican Party. So the personnel, Craig Blair, Republican from Berkeley, remains the president. Senator Tom Takubo remains majority leader. Senator Amy Grady, a grade school teacher from Mason County, will become the new Education Committee chairmanship. And there hasn't been an Education Committee chair that's been a teacher mm -hmm. in 30 yep. or 40 years. Right. And Senator well, Eric Tarr, Republican from Putnam County, will remain the powerful Finance Committee chair. Mike Wolfel, Democrat. Democrat from Cabell County will be the new Senate minority, le minority leader, so that's what we've all got to keep track of. All right. Thank you very much, Randy. Now, we'll move ahead to uh, Governor Jim Justice delivered his seventh State of the State address in a joint session of the legislature. Earlier, Randy filed a story about what the governor told us. With a state revenue surplus nearing $2 billion, Justice said he wanted to advance a 2022 economic development drive that he says brought 29 businesses into the state, invested more than $6 billion, and created or preserved more than 6,000 jobs. He said his proposed three-year phase-in of a 50% personal income tax cut would be monumental. 30% the first year, 10% the next year, 10% the next year, and then, and then we step back and just see with all that being said, think of how much if I were to walk into you and say, I'm going to put a billion dollars back into our economy tomorrow and the people will spend it. What will be the multiplier effect of that? Will it be six times or ten times? Tomorrow you have become your own stimulus package with zero growth. Justice proposed sending $40 billion to state hospitals to make adjustments and offset minimal reimbursement to PEIA insurance holders and deliver a promised pay raise. I am proposing for the fourth time a 5% pay raise to every one of, a wor of our state workers. Both the House and Senate proposed dividing the Department of Health and Human Resources into three separate cabinet agencies. Justice said he and his expert staff need to listen to those ideas. We can make it better. We need to listen to your ideas. You need to listen to ours. You need to absolutely bounce ideas off of Dr. Marsh and, and General Hoyer and, and, and Jeff Coven. Absolutely, I am as open-minded as one could ever be. On the education front, Justice proposed $37 million go to a school aid formula increase for first grade teachers, $15 million into the HOPE scholarship program, $75 million into higher education deferred maintenance, and an initiative to let all parents see their child's curriculum online. All of our parents deserve to know exactly what's going on in the classroom. Without any question, our parents have always known what the best is for their kids. Tonight, I am proposing a bill to direct school systems to make all curriculum taught be available online where we can see every single thing that's being put into our little kids' heads. The governor also proposed an $11 million effort to stop hunger in West Virginia, $1 million for child pregnancy centers, incentives for veterans to move back to their home state, and a quarter billion dollars to consolidate state laboratories. But there was a time, believe it or not, that we cut a ribbon and celebrated a Taco Bell opening in, in downtown Charles. Now think about what we're doing today. Think about the stuff that's going on today in this great state. These and even more justice initiatives now go to the legislature for consideration and debate. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Randy Yowie in Charleston. Thanks, Randy. The governor also proposed some financial help for what he called the forgotten state retirees, a basic $1,000 cost of living increase and a bonus, a one-time bump of $1,500. And he proposed a million dollars to create a Marshall University Center for Economic and Community Development in the African-American communities of Appalachia. While the Republicans hold a supermajority in both chambers, there are still Democrats representing their constituents. Next up, 
Reporter Chris Schultz sits down with Senator Mike Wolfel from Cabell County and Delegate Doug Scaff from Kanawha County to discuss what it's like to be in the minority and their expectations for the coming session. 12 to 15 minutes. Senator Mike Wolfel and Senator, is the Senate Majority Leader and Delegate Doug Scaff is the Minority Leader in the House. Both join me now on the legislature today. Good evening, gentlemen. Chris, thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay. So, gentlemen, it's no secret that the Democrats are at a disadvantage in both chambers this year. Uh, Senator Wolfel, why don't we start with you? What are your plans or hopes for this session? Um, I've got a fair number of bills that are important to me <clears throat> that, uh, in fact, two have already passed the Senate at this early date and are, have been received in the House. One is a, vic a victims of, victim of sexual assault bill, and another is a bill involving uh, recovery residences. So that's legislation that got through the Senate last year unanimously and just was not taken up or didn't pass the House. So um, those, those are some of the items that I'm looking at. And of course, we got a, a really big head start on everyone yesterday. Yeah, and I'm certainly very interested in talking to you about that in just a moment, but Delegate Scaff, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity. Uh, so what are your hopes and, and, and objectives for this session? Well, you know, my Democratic colleagues, we just want to make sure that everyone's voices are heard. We know we're outnumbered, you know, 88 to 12, and it's a tall order. We got to see that on day one when there was a few amendments that we just slightly lost. <laughs> but the, the bottom line is we want to make sure everyone's represented and their voices heard. We think that we have a tremendous opportunity in front of us with this surplus money right now. We don't think we need to spend that money. We should invest that money, invest in the future of West Virginia and to the people that it will definitely trickle down to. So I'm gonna push you both just a little bit here. How can you accomplish that with so few members at your disposal in your caucus? Delegate Scaff? Sure, you know, I think it's important. You have to have good relationships with the other side. You know, work. forget about party politics, the election's over, put the R and the D aside. Build relationships with your colleagues. It shouldn't matter who maybe that first name is at the top of the bill, but if it's a good idea. Speaker Hanshaw and I have a great working relationship. He always says he doesn't care who gets the credit for it. If it's a good idea, we need to move it forward. And so what I need to encourage our colleagues to do is to work with the Republicans. And if it's okay, just as long as their idea gets passed through, um, it doesn't matter who takes the full credit for it when it comes to that. We just want to see it uh, go through. And then the second thing we need to do is we need to work together. We need to come up with the ideas. We may have, we all care about public education. You all care about fixing PEIA and DHHR. I mean, but the bottom is we have different ideas of how to get there. So let's take our ideas. The speaker has offered a, you know, open door policy and just make sure we can be patient. Uh, we have to pick and choose our battles and get up and, and, and talk and, and just ask the pertinent questions to make sure that nobody's left out of the equation. Senator, there's just three of you. I mean, how do you accomplish what you want to accomplish? Well, um, we, we have, uh, we're three, but we're pretty effective uh, three. And in the Senate, it's a little bit different. You have a manageable number and you have good legislation that people, regardless of their party affiliation, will get behind. Um, we saw that yesterday, again, with a lot of bills that passed unanimously last session that came on out. So I don't know what it's like in the House. I've never served there, but I can tell you that a good bill will, um, will see the light of day and be considered in, this, in the state Senate. So let's talk about the procedure here. You know, you talk about a good bill seeing the light of day. Uh, the Senate has already passed 25, was it, uh, at last count bills, and we're only at the end of the second day of session. Um, you know, Senator, what I'm most curious about is you had to suspend the rules to do that. I mean, people have been expressing a concern about open governance. What do you say to those people? Well, there were two bills that we challenged, that I challenged, um, and um, certainly we were outnumbered. Um, that was a critical race theory. Felt like that should have gone through and be vetted. Uh, the governor's powers, I didn't think uh, that needed to be expedited. But the rest of those bills, I personally studied last session and the session before. Some of those bills have been passed two and three times. So I personally have a clear conscience on that. Those bills are bills that I've helped amend, that I've argued over, and they've languished in the House, and no disrespect to House leadership, but we send routinely <clears throat> 50 bills over there that never see the light of day. And we work really hard to do that. 
We work those committees. We work on Saturdays. We work late at night. And so why, you know, again, my recovery residence bill will be a leadership bill in the country. So why would I wait to go through the committee process and have fewer days, <clears throat> excuse me, for it to maybe be considered in the House? <clears throat> so I don't have a problem with, with uh, facilitating the passage of bills that have been vetted and sending them over to the House. And you guys need to act on them. Take right. a look at them. They never, some of those bills never saw a committee. I don't know what they're doing over there, but you know what I'm saying is I, I'm, I'm fine with what we did yesterday with the exception of a couple of bills. So, Delegate Scaff, I'm going to give you an opportunity for a rebuttal, and then I'd like to talk yeah, about sure. that term in just a moment. So what do you have to say to uh, what No, I Senators? think, you know, what he said is correct. We've had bills, same thing, you know, on the House that go to the Senate, and they don't see the light of day. And obviously, neither one of us gets to make that call of what bills get seen in committee and brought forth. I think bills that we've seen for two, three years, it's okay. Let's get them through. Let's get them done. Let's get them across the finish line, like the senator said. But new bills, new pieces of legislation, it's a little, little concerning. We have a supermajority in the House, a supermajority in the Senate. We can't slow that process down. And the reason why sometimes it's important to slow it down is so they can be fully vetted, give the people's voice, get the people who it will touch and affect the most a chance to be heard. And then bring experts in and have testimony inside the committee rooms so we can hear what the maybe unintended consequences might be or what some of the benefits we haven't thought of. Or we could even make the bill better. So I'm a little nervous. Our forefathers said, that, you know, bill has to come through the process and sit for two days, give everybody a chance to learn about it, uh, read it, study it, amend it, make changes and make it for the best. So. Uh, I'm a, you know, I'm a little bit of a historian here, and you know, I, I'd like to take our time when it comes to bills that aren't a major emergency that have not already been fully vetted and through the process. I'm a little concerned that we're going to go too fast. That's when mistakes are made. So speaking of the speed of, of of things and fully vetting some of these laws, mm -hmm. I mean, the House just yesterday uh, changed a rule that no longer allows rebuttal on the floor in debate. Does, does that concern you? And, and again, continuing this conversation about open governance. It does a little bit. I'll tell you why. So you, they, you can ask as many questions as you want in the committee and on the floor. But when debate, you want to talk for or against the bill, they limit it to one time. Well, what happens is a lot of times you have a right, spirited, heated debate out there on the floor. Somebody might speak after you or they might even challenge you and call you out or say something that you don't agree with or just flat out wasn't true. Now you have no chance to come back and, and correct them or talk about it. Uh, that's not good government. You know, I don't think that bill, that, that type of uh, motion was ever abused in the past. Yeah, you have a few people that talk, you know, two times on a bill or whatnot, just to clarify something. But we had, the Democrats offered this amendment. We had numerous uh, Republicans actually voted for this amendment too. And a lot of them have come to a sense saying, hey, we were with you. We don't think we should stifle debate. We should, your, everyone's voices should be heard and they should have more than one chance to defend their position. So, I mean, that's part of the reason they're here is to get the other side of the argument. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to ask you about some of the things that Governor Justice discussed last night in his State of the State address. The biggest thing that seems to jump out to most people is this 50 percent proposed cut to uh, personal income tax. Um, so let's start with you, Senator. What are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, we know that our governor um, is a very optimistic person. <laughs> so, so he's optimistic about the future of the state. He believes in that, in that approach. Um, my view personally is uh, we can afford some moderate income tax re or tax reform. It may take various uh, forms, but what I heard him mention last night, but not get into details about, our kids in foster care, our child protective services kids, our kids that have been abused and neglected, that number has risen by 50% since 2014. Uh, we don't have CPS workers. Kids are in dire straits. They're living where they shouldn't be living. And we recently had a, f a hiring freeze. So uh, I would have liked to have seen the governor provide a lot of detail on how he's going to attack that. Um, sure, we're <clears throat> natural gas has gone up 400% in the last 24 months. Coal is going to finish out this year probably at 125 dollars a ton. Mm -hmm. We are in a global economy, so there's a war going on. And Russia is a, obviously an energy supplier to Europe and, the, and other parts of the world. So naturally, we're going to be fat. We're going to be set for the moment when it comes to energy uh, taxes that are, are from, from the uh, 
oil and gas industry. So that plus the federal government stimulus money, this is a unique situation. We can't just cut taxes at 50 percent, uh, you know, a billion dollar hole in the budget and say that everybody's going to move here. I mean, that's just that's too optimistic. Delegate Scaff, I know that this is something that you all discussed during your um, House response earlier today, but what are your thoughts on this 50 percent cut? I totally agree with the senator. The bottom line here is this: Hey, everyone is for meaningful tax, you know, reform or incentives that give back to West Virginians. Well, here's where I'm at: We need to get our house in order first. Like the senator just spoke, you know, we have foster care issues, public education. We haven't put much money into that, and actually fixing our public education system. We we can't afford to pay drivers and personnel what they need. What about mental health uh, professionals inside the classrooms? K through two, you know, maybe aids in the classrooms. Our, you know, like I said, our roads, our infrastructure, our internet, PEIA, we, we have to get our house in order first. Let's, if everything was perfect and West Virginia was just, you know, we had no issues out there, paying CPS workers, our prisons and jail systems can afford to hire people. We have so many vacancies right now across the state, it's ridiculous. So why not focus on some of those things that we have right now that we can do better at first? with this surplus money. Then, whatever's left over, let's see what, how we can give back to the West Virginians when it comes to personal income tax, maybe it's a vehicle car tax, whatever it is. But I think it's a little optimistic right now and aggressive to just go here. We have no forecast. We need to quit operating off the cusp. We don't have a five, 10, or 15 year plan. We might be able to pay for that this year, like the Senator said, we might be able to pay for it next year. What if severance taxes go down? to 2014 or 16 numbers, we would be in a huge hole, then you'd have to raise taxes somewhere else to pay for that so that the services aren't cut. The last thing we need to do is to reduce the taxes that the West Virginians pay out of the right pocket, but increase taxes they have to pay out of the left pocket. We're, we're flushed right now, but we may not be flushed two years from now. So we're in the last couple of minutes here of our time together, gentlemen. I wanted to ask you something that you both brought up the restructuring of DHHR. This is something that passed last year, was vetoed by the governor. Why do you think this year is different? Well, the, the DHHR has grown to be just a massive agency that spends, I don't know, six, seven, seventy percent of our, sixty percent of our tax revenue goes there. It's unmanageable. So it needs to be diced up a little bit so that it can be managed. Uh, it, it, again, you have children that are in foster care we're in dire straits with what's going on there with DHHR. Um, I, and I take the governor and his word that he will follow up on that with collaboration with House and Senate leadership and membership. I want to give you, Delegate Scaff, one last. Uh, no, I totally agree. DHH and Art, we have to quit kicking the ball down the road. You have to do something. You got to do something differently. It's not something you can just throw money at and think that those problems are going to go away. That department is so big and so massive and affects so many people and a lot of our vulnerable West Virginians. We have to get it right. We don't know all the right answers. I don't know the quick fix solution, but like we gotta take a systematic approach and do something differently if you want different results. Well, gentlemen, thank you both so much. Thank you. Senator Wolfel, uh, Minority Leader in the Senate, Delegate Scaff, Minority Leader in the House, yeah. for coming on to our show this evening. Thank, thank you, you Chris. so much. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having us. And thank you, gentlemen. The legislature today returns to a daily broadcast now, so Come back tomorrow and every Monday through Friday at 6. We'll have more news and interviews from the 2023 legislative session. And remember, West Virginia Public Broadcasting is covering the session daily. Our radio news programs, WVU Morning, West Virginia Morning, and on our news site at wvpublic.org. We also broadcast the daily floor sessions of both the House and Senate on the West Virginia channel and we stream those on our website as well. I'm Bob Brunner for everyone here at WVPV. Thanks for joining us and 